Thanks all the traffic. <laughs> Thank you, Annie, for introducing Margie and me. Thank you, Majors and Quinn, for hosting this event. Do they have lots of books here? <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint, they need to pay for electricity. <laughs> um, Thank you, Norton Stillman, for publishing the books that Margie and I are going to read from tonight. Norton, raise your hand so everybody can see the order. <laughs> Mr. Norton Press. <laughs> so half the time tonight, I'm going to do a few riddles and the other half some poems. The riddles are numbered. This is 41. Because if they had a title, that would give away the solution. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we're just being sneaky. <clears throat> Riddle 41. Blow the clouds away and everything lightens. The woods, the afternoon, the windows free to bloom. Maybe its movement is how love works. Who's got an idea what that is? Mm. You're going to put you on the spot now. Storm. Mm -hmm. Storm. Wind. The wind. Bingo. <laughs> I wrote a poem about it once. <laughs> is that, did you include the words movement is how love works? <laughs> I'm especially fond of that line. <laughs> and 70. I wish he'd found her neck soft and alluring. His hand looked for a room inside her blouse. Mm. And she smiled, a perfect omelette. What do these three sentences have in common? What might they be? I wish he'd found her neck soft and alluring. His hand looked for a room inside her blouse. And she smiled, a perfect omelette. Anybody want to make a guess? This is not school. <laughs> you do not have to be afraid of, what did you say? Who just said hard? That one is deliberately hard. <laughs> Here is my solution. Those are outlines for three flash novels. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're the whole novel. <laughs> All right. Riddle number 37, what will that be? Oh dear. <laughs> he holds it like he'd hold a guitar when playing rapido or staccato, firing off his Johnny one note. Can't tell what key that's in, but now everybody's flying through the air. There are no spaces between notes in his riff. That is not pretty. That is bloody. He spent hours imagining reaching an audience. He holds it like he'd hold a guitar. A machine gun. But wait, wait, wait. What about he? What about the he in there? Serial killer. Exactly. Very good. Let's see if we can find something a little bit lighter, Sharon. <laughs> this is one of the most mindless events in your life. And you do it over and over. You just sit or stand or squat and let it run. Or splat, gush, tinkle. Oh, piddle, let it rip. As number one, it may also leak. It's usually over after the last rip. Good riddance. 
<laughs> so if you didn't get that, see me after the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> He's petite and darkly bridled in his virgin ivory linen, fluttering gilded ribbons as he struts toward his torrid groom, who did not want to enter into this ceremony, but is willing to flirt with passion and even ravish the bride sprawled now under his legs. Prudish death is impartial as to who rises from, from the dust. He is petite and darkly bridal in his virgin ivory linen, fluttering gilded ribbons. He struts toward his torrid groom, who did not want to enter this ceremony, but is willing to flirt with passion and even ravish the bride sprawled now under his legs. Prudish death is impartial as to who rises from the dust. <laughs> Sounds uncomfortable to like a crucifixion. <laughs> well, you're getting warm. He did not want to enter into this ceremony the bride sprawled now under his legs, even ravishes her, him. <laughs> okay, it's a Toreador and a bull. And he gets a Toreador, a bullfighter, and his, um, and the bull that he's fighting. But the bull gets the stronger. He even ravished the bride sprawled under his legs. Okay, um, I think we have time to do another one. Very brief. It's so easy. <laughs> more brain than body, more body than brain. They toil in soil, water them well. Not you. <laughs> more brain than body, more body than brain. They toil in soil, water them well. Soils and soil. Soil. Earthworms. Earthworms, no, but you're kind of close. Yeah. Pardon? A-N-T-S. A-N-T-S. Well, that's possible. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty good. But why would you water a well? That was what eluded me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, if you give up. <laughs> Seeds. Oh. Seed is all brain the way we would think, humans. And eventually it is more body than brain, and they do toil in soil. And it is necessary to water them well. All right, I've got a time limit here, and I'm going to thank you for such a good audience oh. and um, playing along with me. I'm going to read you just a few poems from this book, Little Eternities, mm -hmm. and I'll just give you um, some samples from each kind of poem that's in the book. I really love etymology, and so this poem comes from that. Thistle. In summer, they take their places in the field, a small, happy down doing that changes in autumn, a session of ride out the bother, thorny, prickly as a sharp upper lip. 
many days, like 253,879, are thistles under your proverbial saddle. No one sees them just as no one sees thistles or nettles now. No one is embarrassed for them. They're 33 million years old. And their name, thistle, distal, is 368,000 years old. Etymologists have searched through 1,200 years of words to find the origin, and so far, no luck. <laughs> if you eat the bull thistle blooms, when they're silky dark purple in the field, or crowding the pasture's fence, they taste like candy. Magic and valor returning each year while standing still. Uh, here's a little tone poem. A small repast of tea and kippers. One day I shall swim away like a herring, he said, and be eaten like a fish by death, she said. At high tea, high tide, she pours. He divides the fish. She asked, what was that noise outside? He thought it a loose shingle flapping. They both heard his belly growling. Later the sea, calm down, murmured, she said. Here's a poem that has a formal form. I started it one night when I was watching Night of the Iguana. <laughs> Those characters were pretty inebriated most of the time. So this is a life with the movies. Not too much is it to ask from a week, Tuesday, Night of the Iguana, tequila. I'd hate to drink to nothing at all. Wednesday. The Northwest Passage to Friday. I lift my glass to the empty chair beside me. Not too much, is it, to ask from a week? Thursday is totally mutiny on the bounty. I mix a Titanic, drink three, and you're sunk. I'd hate to drink nothing at all. Chicago, Valentine's Day, Al Capone, still bloody alone, calls for a double shot. Not too much to ask for in a week. Is it Saturday? Dinner at 8? 1933. I'm late. Sunday's love in the afternoon is a boring fling. I hate to drink to nothing. After all, Father knows best. Monday is a light white wine sipped for all the Miss Lonely Hearts. Not too much to ask. Is it from a week of drinking? Nothing at all? That I'd hate. <laughs> I won't turn on the radio. Rather, I'll listen to the rain. A rich companion promising mutual benefits. After a drought or a long absence, the god of rain can be steady or scary. Shock clock to the south, Thor's thunder from the north. I love them both. Some nights love can be desperate as well as passive. Mine bears no grudges against Rain's music, its artful way in bed, leading the listener to sleep's side. <laughs> finish with this one. This is for the millions who were starved to death in Ukraine, the Holodomor. The Holodomor is the name of a man-made famine. And in 1932-33, during the reign of Stalin, he wanted to show how prosperous 
the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the, U the S USSR, was, so he confiscated for export all the wheat from its breadbasket, the Ukraine. Consequently, the Ukrainians had nothing left to sell or eat for the millions who were starved to death in Ukraine. In the lands of etc. and the recurring et of, where genocides come and go, will be and have been, ordered on a timetable by the emperor of madness, a footpath through a field leads to the hollow where a body collapsed and its life passed, a life that in the afterwards continues in saved letters and rumors. I sent to Poland all the clothes we could sell for food. She ate her baby? He would have died anyway. And a man cannot endure this for a long time. There are eight in our family. The clothes chest empty, the grass picked clean, insects and birds, long ago eaten. Thank you. Oh, and now, Margaret, Margaret has it. As soon as I get out of here. Thanks so much, Sharon, and my fellow South Dakotan. Um, you might have noticed by uh, yeah. way of our introductions, we're both from South Dakota. Um, those of you who came after the introductions, Sharon Schmielars, Margaret Hassey, and I'm glad to see you all here. Um, who knew that riddle poems were such a thing? Um, I came across them a few years ago, and so I'm going to begin as a segue into my reading by reading by reading the only riddle poem that I've ever written, but it happened to get published in this book, Shelter, which came out a year ago, um, poems that were all about feeling safe and trying to find places that you feel safe. Um, and this particular poem, um, I, uh, I won't tell you the title either, the way Sharon did, I'll withhold and see how this one goes over on you. It's got eight lines, so it's um, clues, to a riddle in eight lines. When carried in the past, a symbol of prestige, what can be sturdy as a long bone? What's not usually a fair weather friend? What is often left behind and forgotten? <laughs> Without one, a face may be washed. It succumbs to forces that turn it inside out. It decorates a beach and bans a burn. It tents two lovers who kiss. Got it? You got it? Yes, people yeah. are showing. I might be too easy, sure. So, <laughs> so there it is. It's, it's, a, you know, it's an umbrella. Uh, so this, this book is, um, was written um, with a friend um, named Sharon Schm 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 uh, not Sharon Schmiller, Sharon DeMarc who's a watercolor artist. And so she'd send me something she thought was of as a shelter, and I'd respond with a poem, or I'd send her a poem and she'd respond with a painting um, uh, of all shelters. So um, that's my shelter book from a year ago. It's um, been happy in family life because it's something children can read also. So my new book is called um, Summoned, just out in the last um, month and a half ago. And it takes its um, uh, title from, well, that feeling of what you're called to do, what you're called to be, and also from a quote that will appear in one of the poems. And the book is dedicated to mothers and sons and also to my mother and my sons. And one of the themes in it is, um, there's several themes. One of them is the adventure of, of growing older. Um, an another theme is, um, a travel and the excitement of that. And I think of going into old age is kind of a big journey too, with a lot of challenges that come with it. But another uh, theme in the book um, 
is um, the experience of being a white person in America and having privilege. And um, as uh, many writers have said, many people have said, the way that we um, work on white privilege is to really look at ourselves and our situations and, and, um, and figure out ways to be uh, different in the world. So, um, Sharon, you're from South Dakota, I'm from South Dakota, so my first poem that I'm going to read is uh, placed in South Dakota. And in this book, there are 10 poems, all with the same title, which is Another Day of Being White, and then they're subtitled. And this one is Another Day of Being White in South Dakota. My husband <clears throat> ambles into the kitchen to help with a stew. It's plenty of meat and fresh beans. I say I have Indians on my hands when I meant onions. My eyes water with the odor of white rings around my fingers, or maybe I'm crying because $2 I gave to the worn down man with his cardboard sign was almost nothing. Feelings churn, I mistake words as if I'm laughing gas given to a woman with a broken tooth who could afford pain-free repair. My friend Roy used to say that gaps and studs, stubs of tattletale teeth tell of someone growing up poor. He smiled, always smiled, with his mouth closed. My tongue slipped onto Indians because deep into the night, I'd read a book about wounded knee and attended a workshop about the trauma of being white, how we carry in our bodies collective quilt, I mean guilt. I twirl a confirmation ring on my fingers. It's rose gold grape leaves from a mine in the Black Hills where prospectors trample treaties, making it possible 70 years ago for my family to build a house on South Dakota soil in a land grab we didn't want to see. Sometimes my mother sent money to Pine Ridge Reservation along with secondhand clothes. Do you remember the Black Hills Gold um, bracelets, oh, yeah. rings? And that was, um, it was a very pretty uh, thing. And you know, <laughs> being a white person, I loved the jewelry. I loved the gold, and um, and never once thought of what that symbol must be for people who um, were pushed out of their land totally by those who were seeking. Um, the white people who were seeking um, uh, gold. So this poem also is in the series of Another Day of Being White, and it's called Dog Incident Report. My golden doodle puppy, apricot colored, looks like a dust mop on legs. Rosie adores everyone, wants to lick hands, is friendly indiscriminately with all humans in her orbit. Lucky little star, recipient of sunny attention, from many strangers until today when I erred, as the training book calls it, let out the leash five feet and unheeded her dash through the doorway of a bus shelter where a man sat slumped smoking a cigarette. When she came at him, he leaped to his feet onto the bench the way fire jumps, his dark eyes on her, his face a rictus of terror. Was he yanked back to facing a mouthful of guard dog's teeth or to a traffic stop with canine cops who call black men dog biscuits? Maybe he's been warned of feral dogs and rabies. Need I tell you I'm a white woman in a mostly white neighborhood and like the puppy I'm used to being liked. He is a black man uninterested in the apology I try to make from a distance. Am I wrong to make this encounter about race? Can he just be a guy with a primal fear of dog? Oh. Oh. Rita, I'll read this poem for you um, because you said you liked it. It's called My Moose. And um, growing up, I really loved the poet Elizabeth Bishop. Um, some of you may know her work. And um, I was so happy when I had a moose poem rise up in me just as she had a really wonderful moose poem up of hers, um, my moose, my moose, a mo um, my moose, um, a mossy boulder rose from the lake. Water poured from its back and shoulders, taking massive shape. The moose waded into the shallows of green water, his face like a shovel of coal. Nothing rushed his majesty, my moose, not tourists, chatter on sidewalks, 
cameras snapping, not plop of turtles launching from lily pads. As if alone in the world, the moose did not turn his head, stepped onto shore. Everything grew silent as he passed through tamarack and scrub pines, disappeared toward deepest forest. Over the years since that sighting, when harassed by daily life, unanswered requests, shortcomings, I remember the dignity of the moose, how he moved like a god who knew the weight of his antlers, not as weapons, but as worthiness. Oh. So this is the poem um, that the title um, of the book comes from. It's called Another Day of Being White, Summoned. One early morning with a few strangers, white, black, brown, I walk in silence to the crossroads where George Floyd died. It's filled with balloons, flowers woven into blankets, stuffed bears, and among many, this handmade sign. All mothers were summoned when George Floyd called out for his. My thoughts are with my son, who sizzles with fierce words, not just for the policeman who arrested him after curfew, handcuffing him with zip ties. He's also angry at me because I adopted him, or maybe because I'm white, like the cop, and he is brown. He refuses therapy, is moving out in the middle of the pandemic with no plans of where to live. At home, in another shadowy dawn, a family of crows argues. Soon it will be light enough to see how the maple hangs her head over the grass. I can't imagine the future for my son. So I look backward to see a small boy's beautiful body walking into a swimming pool on tiptoe. As the water gets deeper, he points his nose up like a fox smelling the air. He always has been audacious and brave. It's something to hold on to. Summoned. So um, the photograph on, on the cover is by John Torren, who works for um, at Noden Press. He's the designer there. And the picture is of um, part of the Floyd Memorial, a public art piece that um, was done by a very talented um, woman named Mari Mansfield. And the, uh, the project um, that she's, she worked on beyond the installation on the sidewalk is a project called Morning Passage, as in M-O-U-R-N-N-N-G. Um, so this is a poem um, about um, uh, miscarriage, a miscarriage poem mm -hmm. called Moving Water. Before it fell, snow was water, and when captured in a warm mouth, it's water again. The image of a child comes to mind who did not live to be born but is nearby in a pale storm catching flakes in her mouth. With her lips open like a fish to unfulfilling air, might she feel a momentary cold glitter on her tongue just as her name was held briefly in our mouths. Like a figure in the whiteout of a blizzard, sometimes she's here on earth where my live wire son throws himself into life like an Olympic diver into water or an acrobat into air. When he flings his body backward onto a mattress of snow, waving arms, pumping legs to form a snow angel who wears a fan-like skirt, he calls the shape the lost girl. I think of water on the move, how snowfall in Minnesota may have come from the Mediterranean Sea where a drop of water could spend over 3,000 years in the ocean before continuing to another part of the cycle from ice or snow to vapor and liquid. I think of life on the move, from wish to beget, from ancestors to me, to my children, from an unborn daughter to a living son, from breath to death and carbon and stars. Mm. Moving water. And um, another poem uh, called 
another day of being white <laughs> terminology. Um, that is a major theme in the book, but um, it's not the only theme. And um, there are about uh, 60, over 60 poems in the book, and I picked seven for you that I just happened to want to read tonight. Um, some of these in, a, in the suite, in the series. Another day of being white terminology. My mouth stumbles on the latest terms. Do I pronounce Latinx right? I balk at using queer, even though it's on t-shirts at gay pride events. I'm old enough to remember my high school friend taking the double barrel hit of you queer faggot screamed from a passing car. A slow gin bottle smashed on the sidewalk near us. Ms. was revolutionary back then. We've come a long way, baby. I can't, I can use baby for women, but men can't. Although everyone uses ladies at tennis. I donate to the United Negro College Fund and the NAACP, yet don't feel at home saying Negro or colored people, but people of color seems okay for now. Words the current US Census offers are African American and Black. Ralph Ellison was never comfortable with Black, although he and his circle of friends were certainly beautiful. Canada doesn't collect data on race. Some people call my son mixed, a word that makes me think breed of dogs. When pressed to assign him a racial category, I say biracial, although race is not biology, a social construct. When he was little, my son grew upset with the inaccuracy of my self-attribution of white. You are pink, pink, he insisted. <laughs> he, who is now a they, then picked a piggy pink crayon to color me in his family drawing. Pinko is sometimes still used to disparage someone with socialist leanings. My exacting son claims brown for himself, not black. When he was a baby, his white great-grandmother, 101 years old, asked to hold the pickaninny. Each time we visited, he believed, she believed, his complexion was getting lighter, <laughs> as if I'd rub off on him in some way. I had a terrible dream that I'm like her in a nursing home with a pissy smell. I'm aged and addled. When my son visits, I find his darkness foreign and frightening. Up from a child's counting rhyme comes an, comes an old slurry name for someone who looks like him. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. This is my nightmare, and it might be his too. Oh. And um, so you know there's some light poems in the book. I'm afraid to have a freedom poem called um, With Walt Whitman, at Weight Watchers. <laughs> you know, I remember the first time I experienced Walt Whitman. It wasn't um, it wasn't Walt Whitman the poet. It was Walt Whitman's picture on the Whitman chocolates. <laughs> Do you remember that? They had a picture on the Whitman chocolates. Um, so this is with Walt Whitman at Weight Watchers. The new guy with a big belly and Santa beard sits in the back row. A dented hat, buttons on his shirt strained to contain him. At weigh-in, he removes his shoes to balance elephantine on the scale. His voice is lusty and self-contented in his poems, but here he slouches, no longer finding the fat sweet that sticks to his own bones. He fidgets on a plastic chair, unkind to his amplitude. The group discusses low-calorie snacks like rice cakes and how to resist all-you-can-eat buffets. Rocking back and forth on the worn seat of his size XXL pants, he looks expectantly around the room as if at a party that will soon provide confections. When he stands to leave, he says it's poetry, not lunch, calling his soul, detached, ceaselessly seeking. Like Pied Piper, he leads us into the weightless air. We sit in a public park with no gab of gains and losses. Listen to him recite, song of myself. The breeze is soft on our bodies as if we are each wearing the same loose blouse of pleasure. Oh, lovely. I have one more and then we have a little time if there are any questions or maybe I have a question or maybe I have an answer for Sharon. Um, 
but I'll read one more of the lighter poems if I can find it quickly. Um, and it's, um, there are a number of animals in this poem. There's, there's birds and birds like Miriam who writes a lot about birds <laughs> and there are, there's the moose and their pets and there was the, um, there's a poem called the grasshopper and one about the golden doodle, the, um, the uh, one about the dog incident. So this is called St. Francis Pet Cemetery. Under our dog's tongue, the stone of a tumor. We always fed her dry food, but now offer a death row diet, whatever the pooch wants, meat scraps from our plates, casserole with rice. We walk slowly, let her go unleash, stopping in a pet cemetery. A granite statue of St. Francis stands watch over the tombstones. He who tamed the wolf believes in the souls of animals. He raises his hand to bless them all. We'll be back soon to plant ashes among the grave markers, remembering Teensy, a terrier, Busy Bob, a hamster, mm -hmm. and on a cross made of popsicle sticks, Spaz the guppy swimming forever. Oh. Thank you, everyone, um, for coming. Um, I just forgot to mention that I'm always so appreciative of my my family and people who come into my poems partially because we we have to know that poems are you know, works of the imagination. So they might say, I don't remember it quite like that the way you do, and that's fine. Um, uh, both my sons have been very appreciative of my uh, work as a, as a poet and have read many of the poems and usually um, say, yeah, I don't, that's your truth. I don't quite see it that way, but that's all right with me um, and that's all right with them. Um, so, um, Sharon. have any questions? Have any answers? Do people have any questions of us? Patty Wheeler Andrews here, is and what? I just don't recognize her. Patty Wheeler Andrews, not here. Okay, you come to the front desk. Yeah. Pardon? You come to the front desk. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In my office, five Good. minutes. Please <laughs> come to the front desk. What led you to riddles? Well, after my husband died. As he was dying, he said, Sharon, I'm not going to be able to buy you a Christmas present. You go to Spain. You've always wanted to go to Spain. And I really didn't want to go to Spain. But four months after his death, I said, I'll go to Spain. <laughs> and beside the swimming pool, um, this was a Fort workshop. I was the only American Oh, so fun. And the, the presenter was sitting there, and we were talking, and we started talking about riddles and uh, how he loves them. And so I thought, I'll look into riddles, too. And I wish I could remember his name, because there was a man who, were, who was uh, did workshops at the loft. He wrote about... Anyway, give me all the last 30 seconds of stuttering, okay? That's what led me to read the riddles. A swimming pool in Spain. <laughs> Eat your hearts out. <laughs> but riddles are very close to poetry. Riddles probably came first, but poetry is certainly a first cousin, if not a sister, to a riddle. I mean, there have been riddles forever, in every culture on this globe, I'm sure. Sitting around at night, the Anglo-Saxons were particularly fond of doing riddles with solution, twice the penis. <laughs> That's no solution. <laughs> I love every <laughs> I had a question about the uh, the riddle you posed 
what the Toreador, how did you put that image together? I never would have guessed that that was about a bullfight. And um, I'm just curious how you thought of that image as, as well, with the words that you were using to describe it. Well, Toreador, the main one, is usually very beautifully dressed, like women. So I thought, oh, this looks like a bride. Yeah. Yeah. And then I thought of the bull. And being from South Dakota, I've gone to enough rodeos to know that it can be very dangerous and you can get gored by them. And so it's easy for me to see or imagine the Toreador slipping under the bull and then the bull really letting him have it. Mm-hmm. And the ivory is the horn? Pardon? The ivory is the horn? The ivory mm-hmm. is the horn? Talk about ivory. Ivory white. Uh-huh. It's not really a white white, it's kind of an off-white linen. Bridal uh-huh. uh-huh. like mm-hmm. piece of the bridal thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, I this picture is B-R-I-D-L-E. Oh. Oh, very good. Because that that's really what makes a really good riddle. If you could use a word like that, that means yeah. more than one thing. Even if the spelling is a little different. Yeah, I never thought of that. Very good, Pat. Incidentally, there is a solution to all of these riddles in the back of the book. <laughs> <laughs> Pat Peaks. Finding safety in crazy times. Mm-hmm. And then this new book that you wrote, it almost seems like a lot of what you're talking about is having to open your eyes to all of the people that don't have that safety. Mm-hmm. And I guess I was just curious, like, what the experience is like writing with people that don't have that safety. Well, but yeah. thank you, Claire, for saying it that way, because I, I think, um, could you hear that she said the, the other book was about you know, things that jump her in comfort? Um, and, and Sharon and I did go a little bit afield. Um, Sharon DeMarc was the visual artist who did the uh, uh, watercolors with the collaboration. We did go, we did take to heart that some people don't have these safety um, um, measures. And we had a poem and, and uh, illustration called um, Sanctuary, of somebody seeking sanctuary in a church, and then another one about a homeless uh, person. But um, yeah, I, I think this one, I, that one was more about the pandemic, I suppose, and the fear that I had. And this one is more about what happened with, with George Floyd and what has happened to us all and what is our role, what are we called to do in those times. So yeah, it was a big change. Um, the pandemic um, solitude, that was the one good thing for me, is I wrote more than I ever have in my life and it was more productive. I went in three years, four books, I guess, and that's oh. just, I went through a period of time in my life when I had young children that I had two books out and then there was a 20 year gap. So imagine what four books in three years means to me. It means I had a lot of time and solitude and that's what most poets need to, to write. So thanks for asking that question. It's a very different type of a book from a kind of a family book of good cheer to one of really wrestling with some difficult things. Marty, I was so moved by your poems. Yeah. Thank you, Pat. I've got a lot of poets in here, like Stanley. Hi, Stanley. <laughs> hey, um, yeah, I had a question. In writing the, the new book and, and investigating your own white privilege, did you have any surprises or ahas that you didn't realize before? Well, I think the, uh, I mean, a lot of them, I think the poems felt like an aha. Um, I didn't realize that that dream I had 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 to do a lot with kind of going into all. I thought it was only going into Alzheimer's. That's a bad dream. But that I wouldn't recognize my own sons or would fear them. That that was something that I was different about. Or um, this this ring that I did dig out of my jewelry box and, and found and actually realized I'm wearing. I didn't have turned it so backwards so you wouldn't see it. It's a Black Hills gold ring, and that was an aha. I mean, have you once thought, Mike, Mike lived in South Dakota for a while. Um, did you ever think of it just as a, a big symbol of, you know, kind of white supremacy and taking over the Black Hills? And it was all to do with gold, and Black Hills gold is the main 
mean, that's the goal. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people in South Dakota think that way, that it was all about greed and exploitation. Yeah, but that we didn't connect it. I mean, I never connected it to these beautiful little rings that people would wear around. I mean, it's like wearing a big Masonic ring that was a big ring that says, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, anyway, that was an option. <laughs> Surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader, and then I put God says what what or what God says what what but um, no pleasure in writing um, and no pleasure in in, uh, li in listening. So I always take a, quite a bit of pleasure in writing. Do you, Sharon? You must. You really mm -hmm. have a very a very serious schedule of writing, and you're one of my most prolific friends. I mean, I think, boy, I I got lucky with with these four books in three years. But how how many books have you written? 13. 13. And three children's books. Mm -hmm. Children's books. Mm -hmm. And that means you really have a, have a rigid, a rig, rigorous schedule, don't you? Abraham? Well, I taught for 30 years, so I didn't uh, do a lot of writing when I was teaching. <laughs> but actually, poetry saved my life and made me a better teacher because the last 10 years, I was ready to quit. And then I took this poetry class, and all of a sudden I had some life outside of the classroom, and I brought that enthusiasm into the classroom with me, and I made it through the last 10 years. Well, well, I, I found that very true that um, I had a kind of relay going, and my writing wasn't going up all that well. I concentrated on my reading. I mean, my, my teaching, and when the teaching wasn't going well, I concentrated on my writing. It was kept being refreshed, mm -hmm. and my mm -hmm. students loved it. Mm -hmm. they, they, I would always give them extra credit that they would get up and read a poem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I, it was a very good thing for my teaching. Mm -hmm. And I read a poem, and also um, one of the interesting things, I, I think most people had to recite a poem. Didn't, didn't you all have to memorize a poem sometime yeah. along? Oh, can, yeah. you, can you trot it out now? Oh, yeah. can, anybody, can you, what, what, what would it be? What's the first, what's the first stanza? Yeah, what was it? Do you remember the poem, name of the poem? Yeah, it's Robert Frost. And what is it? Would you wish you were there? I think I know. Yeah. yeah. And the village says, you will not see me stopping here to help the poor go up the stairs. Beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's funny how, you know, you, it really goes back and you stay, and when was it? Oh, well, what about when in disgrace was more fortunate than died? <laughs> oh, you wrote that one down. So, um, what were you going to say? The vast and trunkless legs stand in the desert. Yeah. Ozymandias. Yeah, yeah. And, and that wasn't a grade school poem. Hell no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Mike, what about you? What's your? Well, my father used to like to um, have his kids recite poetry. Oh. And so he would encourage us to memorize poems and then recite them to him. But he liked long poems. <laughs> <laughs> and the ones I learned are much too long to recite here. He, he was a great fan of Robert Service. Service. Uh -huh. Robert <laughs> Service. Yeah. yeah, and in particular, he loved the cremation of Sam McGee and oh, the yes. of Sam McGrew, of course. <laughs> and so we, uh, we were often... Uh, yeah. Sam McGee was from Tennessee, right? <laughs> Cotton blooms and blows, yes. <laughs> I, I actually love that poem, didn't you? I mean, if you know it, you just have to gallop along with yes. that poem. And rhyme and rhythm really help to memorize. Yeah. Did you have one by her? No, not along the way? No, not even uh, a, a little one? But, um, the shortest poem in the world, um, Fleas, Adam Haddam. That's what one of my English <laughs> teachers said to me. Anyway, sorry. Um, well, but Sharon, um, shall we each read a poem, close, and then have some refreshments? Oh, yeah. I hope you're all hungry. Go ahead, yeah. Marjorie. Uh, I was going to end it, right? Oh, I can, no, I can read. Go ahead. I can get up. Um, does anybody have a, I went to, um, years ago, a, a poetry reading that Robert Blythe um, led, and he called it a po Persian reading, and people in the audience would say, do you have a poem with a cat in it? 
And then, and then poets would all be slipping through their books or their memory and come out with something. Does anybody want to say, do you have a poem with a something in it or some themes? And see if we do. Unless you've got a poem to end. Just read a poem. Just read a poem? Read yeah. a poem. Okay. And we'll come over there. If I just stand here, can I project yeah, my voice? Yeah, yeah. All right. <coughs> so I just wanted to, um, I thought to end the, my part of the reading, I will end it by reading you this poem, which is called Little Eternities. And the poem gave its name to the book. Little Eternities, an energetic but murky mating in the bog, fogs thick in the muck, no leg room between, not like patio chairs arranged to stand apart from each other, not like families separated by miles or rage, not like ghosts of those long gone, rather like crowding into a blinding urge to dwell intensely. Look at, shivering, look at shimmering leaves in sunlight. They never move alone. Unless you remember autumn's last leaf dangling on a branch, but you won't, in spring, you won't favor a clan of faded ladies. I too deadhead flowers to abet the next blossom. Once, I walked in a field of peonies, of every color and ruffled petal. Blue dragonflies also visited. The rain had stopped and the sun hadn't yet unleashed its strongest heat. Thus around noon, for long moments, we were all together. <laughs> So I'll read to close um, my part of it. Um, born into one body. Born into one body. Isn't it odd how we're born in one country and not another? Could have been any other color except what we are. We might speak Parsi and send our dead to the place of birds. Strange that we work at desks in cool rooms, not making clothes in factories, sweltering, being slapped or called donkey is all. What if we suddenly changed into another, disappeared into a labyrinthine soup, wearing shorts and a baseball cap, and emerging as a man in a tabella, or a woman with red embroidery of henna on her hands? We'd sit in the shade of a palm tree feed dates to a child never seen before, but surely, surely she is ours. Oh, 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 oh.